Welcome to Revolution Books, Emergency Forum, War in Ukraine, What is Happening, Why is it Happening, Where do the Interests of Humanity Lie, and What Does It Have to Do with the Revolution Humanity So Urgently Needs. After showing this video last night on this week's episode of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show, I asked, look familiar? It should. It's not Ukraine. It's what your U.S. government called shock and awe, directed against a sovereign nation, Iraq, in 2003 on the basis of outright lies. Mass deception delivered by Colin Powell on the orders of President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney. The point? A dangerous brew of deception spews from the mouths, the newspapers, the television, and the online commentators to forge masses of people and governments interviewing what is happening in Ukraine as a struggle between good guys and bad guys between the aggressor and the victim. And not so, by the way, it is presented this way as good guys and bad guys, aggressor and victim, within the Russian bloc, by their ruling class, as well as by the larger, more powerful US bloc. This narrative, this framework, emanates from the mouth of, George, of Joe Biden and the parrots of the major media and even the most alternative so-called radical media, that what we are witnessing in Ukraine is a struggle between, as Biden put it in his nauseating State of the Union speech, quote, as the battle between democracy and autocracy, end quote. And in order to line up and firm up the allegiance of the people here and in other countries with the U.S. bloc, Biden continued saying, quote, the democracies are rising to the moment, and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security, end quote. So tonight here at Revolution Books, we're going to pierce this web of deception, cast off the illusions and the delusions that blind and bind people to U.S. imperialism and to the framework of capitalism imperialism more broadly. And yes, all this in the name of American democracy the American democracy that brought shock and awe against Iraq that resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths and millions of refugees and set in motion a series of wars that continue to today from Afghanistan to Yemen. An ongoing horror show, every bit as depraved as what Russia is doing in the Ukraine. Tonight in this emergency forum, we're going to pose that there is a way to understand what is happening, objectively, scientifically, and that there is a way out of this unfolding horror through liberating revolution. So, let me welcome you to Revolution Books in New York City, Harlem. And, yeah. Yeah. and welcome everybody who's watching online. My name is Andy Z. I'm the host of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show, a show like none other. Every week, the RNL show brings to you the necessity, the possibility, the strategy, and the goal of a revolution to emancipate all of humanity here and around the world. This is a show that follows and applies the leadership of the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, and the framework for the new communism that he has developed. This framework provides the scientific method and approach to know and to change the world through an 
absolutely liberating revolution, again, for the emancipation of all humanity. It is the opposite of the exploitive, oppressive system that dominates the world today and the frameworks that they have of this American democracy to rope people in and to convince people to go along with the oppression that is wrought at home and abroad. In this emergency forum on the war in Ukraine, we are gonna address what is happening, why is it happening, where do the interests of humanity lie, and what does it have to do with the revolution that humanity so urgently needs. Raymond Lada, who's sitting over here, is gonna provide us with a historical and analytical analysis to understand all of this. And then after he speaks, I'll come back and just make a few comments, and then we're going to have a question and answer. But here's a few points just to get started. This, the illegitimate, the illegal, the brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and how the U.S. and the Western powers respond is a major shaping event whose impact should not be underestimated. All wars are full of uncertainty calculation and miscalculation. And with the Russia and the US possessing 8,000 nuclear weapons with the possibility of destroying the earth and much of life on it, the danger is truly profound. This must not be underestimated. There is at the same time, the danger of how people here in the United States, as well as around the world, are being fed a dangerous ideological poison of American chauvinism a way of thinking that leads people to see their interests bound up with the system that exploits, oppresses, and terrorizes the people of the world. A system which has created a myth of America as the land of the free, the land of opportunity, with freedom and justice for all, when the brutal, the bitter reality is that this country is founded on the genocide of the native peoples and the theft of their land and the theft of one-third of Mexico through a bloody war. This is a country whose startup wealth was from the enslavement of African people and the continued super exploitation and oppression of black people and people of color ever since, right down to today. This is a country that claims to welcome the tired, the poor, the huddled masses, and then has built up its wealth through the demonization, deportation, and incarceration of immigrants. This is a country with the largest prison population in the world, a country where women throughout its history have been treated as second-class citizens and who today are subject to rape, sexual violence, degradation, and now are on the brink of losing the fundamental right to abortion without which their bodies, their lives, their futures will be enslaved to the state. A country where LBG, LBG2, LGBTQ, there you go, people, have just won some of the most basic rights which now hang in the balance and stand to be taken away. A country which is by far the largest polluter of the earth. The US has waged wars, invaded, staged coups all around the world for most of its existence. All the God bless Americas that are uttered by those who rule over the people of this country should give pause to think about what kind of God would create such a monstrous system. And then scientifically see the light that this is not some imaginary God that created this horror, but the system we live under, capitalism, imperialism, a system whose time needs to be and can be up. To get at the heart of America, the good guys, I want to show a short film clip from Bob Avakian from a speech he gave in 2017, The Trump-Pence Regime Must Go, uh, this is a film against that fascist Trump-Pence regime. That whole movement is seeking to come back to, into power today. And there's a lot in that film, which you can see at Revcom.us or on the YouTube channel uh, at the Revcoms, uh, where our show is uh, hosted. Uh, and then we're going to show a short clip from that that's going to be followed by uh, a short uh, excerpt of a piece that Bob Avakian just wrote called Shameless American Chauvinism, Anti-Authoritarianism as a cover for supporting U.S. imperialism that was uh, created in, as a visual uh, message by the crew of the RNL show. So if we could play those that now, but why don't we turn down. One of the biggest obstacles standing in the way and weighing people down 
is American chauvinism. The disgusting notion that America and Americans are better and more important than everybody else. This is a poison infecting people broadly in this country, even among the bitterly oppressed. And there is a great need for people to break with this American chauvinism. Free yourself from the GTF, the great tautological fallacy. A fallacy, an idea or way of thinking that is false, wrong. A tautology, a round in a circle way of reasoning that asserts something and then claims to prove it by merely asserting the same thing again. So the great tautological fallacy to which I am referring is the notion that America is a force for good in the world. And therefore, whatever it does is good, or at least done with good intentions, even if the same thing, when done by other forces, especially by forces opposed to us, is bad, is evil, because, because America is a force for good in the world. <laughs> Thus, in the grip of the great tautological fallacy, when one is told by the authorities and government and the media, etc., that North Korea developing a small number of nuclear weapons and a few long-range ballistic missiles poses a grave threat, one does not question. One does not ask why that is a grave threat, while the only country ever to use nuclear weapons, the United States, having thousands of nuclear weapons and the capability to use them anywhere in the world is somehow not a grave threat. For those of us who are not willing to be blinded by this GTF, we can and must confront and analyze reality as it actually is and draw the necessary conclusions. Besides the fact that the U.S. is today and has historically been allied with many authoritarian governments throughout the world, and in fact has forcibly installed such governments in many countries, the even more fundamental fact is that the essence of the conflict between the U.S. and countries like Russia and China is not one between democracy and authoritarianism, but is a matter of rivalry among imperialist powers, all of which are monstrous oppressors of masses of people, and none of which represent or act in the interest of humanity. What is called for, and urgently now, is to oppose all imperialist marauders and mass murderers in all systems and relations of oppression and exploitation, while giving particular emphasis to opposing our own imperialist oppressors who commit their monstrous crimes in our name and seek to rally us to support them on the basis of a grotesque American chauvinism, which we must firmly reject and fiercely struggle against. No one with a shred of humanity should support Putin's aggression, his bloody invasion, and what seems to be his plan to occupy Ukraine. But it is worth repeating what is unfolding in Iraq and in, in the Ukraine is not the righteous struggle between the good guys the forces for U.S.-style democracy versus the evil, even maniacal authoritarian autocracy of Putin. It is rather, as B.A. wrote and we just heard, quote, a matter of rivalry among imperialist powers, all of which are monstrous oppressors of masses of people, and none of which represent or act in the interests of humanity. What is called for urgently now as Bob Avakian said, is to oppose all imperialist marauders and mass murderers and all systems and relations of oppression and exploitation while giving particular emphasis to opposing our own imperialist oppressors who commit their monstrous crimes in our name and seek to rally us to support them on the basis of a grotesque American chauvinism which we must firmly reject and fiercely struggle against. Right now, all too many people in this country are scurrying their behinds up behind the U.S. ruling class and its monstrous military machine. Let me give an example from someone who I used to really like a lot. Little Steven, little Stevie Van Zandt, who plays Silvio Dante in The Sopranos. 
and has been a part of Bruce Springsteen's uh, band since its inception. Little Stevie has succumbed in a grotesque manner to the GTF. <laughs> and I know many of you younger people don't know that Little Steven was a very progressive musician. He uh, put out some great records and was a major force in creating a cultural movement against apartheid in South Africa. But here's what he's been running on Twitter. And it's, this has become a, a big deal because it's being discussed on the major news channels. This is just a small selection of these tweets, and I think it represents what all too many people think and must not be thinking. He wrote, he tweeted, what happens if we destroy the Russian convoy and the forces encircling the cities with airstrikes or drones up front? What exactly does Russia do about it? Let's hear it. I'm just asking. How can we watch this madness and do nothing? We are better than him and stronger. Let's act like it. The world needs a police force. Until the UN is properly militarized, it has to be us. Wow. We who, little Stephen? Your boss, that is Springsteen, once wrote a song called Blinded by the Light. You now, unfortunately, are blinded and deluded about what kind of future the US brings. In fact, as my colleague Raymond Lada will go into soon, the United States with its IMF and World Bank and all of its arms and armies around the world, we enforce its own form of imperialist domination. And one more thing to little Stephen and anybody else who's at home thinking like, well, why don't they do this? Why don't they do, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? But to little Stephen, bravado on a TV show with Tony Soprano is one thing. But playing with two countries who hold 95% of the nuclear weapons in the world, with the U.S. being the only country that has ever used it, not once but twice, is beyond crazy. It is playing with fire that could consume everything. So with this, I want to introduce Raymond Lada uh, to go into, again, what is, what is it we're facing and why are we facing it? Well, I want to welcome everyone to uh, tonight's emergency forum, both the in-person audience here and uh, those who are watching uh, from all points east, west, north, and south here and around the world. So welcome to tonight's forum. Um, Andy has spoken about the warmongering and the hypocritical self-righteous condemnation of the Russian invasion by the US imperialists and the US media. It must be said and repeated, no other imperialist power holds a candle to the US when it comes to unjust invasions violations of national sovereignty and regime change. As Andy also emphasized, anyone with heart and conscience should oppose the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine. But we here in the belly of the beast have a special responsibility to mainly expose and oppose our own imperialist rulers, to expose and oppose their imperialist aims, actions, and objectives. They are, in fact, the greatest exploiters and oppressors of the people of the world. And it must be said and repeated, the US imperialists are not acting as they proclaim, as guardians of democracy against authoritarianism. No, they are pursuing their exploitative and murderous global imperialist interests doing so in our name, seeking to rally our support for their crimes and for their empire. Now this brings me to the heart of my talk. 
I want to pull the lens back and address how it is that Ukraine is not a battleground for democracy, but a conflict zone of imperialist rivalry between Russian imperialism and U.S. and Western imperialism. I want to talk about the global developments and dynamics that are shaping this conflict. But before getting into this, let me point out that the history of Ukraine and Russia is both very unfamiliar to most of us, and what we do know is distorted through a certain pro-U.S. imperialist lens. Now that history would take more time than I have tonight to unravel. But we do have available a packet here at the counter, uh, and people watching online can go to revcom.us to get the basics of this. First, some background. And uh, people received a map when they entered, and I believe we're gonna see one on the screen, our viewing audience will. Um, first, some background. Ukraine is a country of some 44 million people with a rich history. It is the second largest country in Europe. Ukraine shares a vast, about 1,700 mile land and sea border with Russia. Ukraine also borders Poland, Hungary, Romania, among other countries. On the south of Ukraine is the Black Sea. This region is important uh, for trade for Ukraine, Turkey, and especially Russia. For Russia as an imperialist power, this region uh, is important economically for shipping oil and natural gas, as well as grain, and thereby gaining leverage over countries that rely on these imported materials. The Black Sea region is also critical for projecting Russian military power to Europe, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Russia also has a major naval military base in a Black Sea port in Crimea, a region that used to be part of Ukraine, but which Russia seized in 2014. As for U.S. imperialism, since the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1990-91, the U.S. has drawn other Black Sea countries like Romania and Bulgaria into the military alliance in Europe that the U.S. heads up that is called NATO. And Ukraine, with its large border with Russia, has become closely entwined with the US. America has provided Ukraine with great amounts of economic and military aid since the early 2000s. And the US had a big hand in an uprising that took place in Ukraine in 2014 that have put a government in power that is friendly to the U.S. and aiming to become part of NATO, that military alliance based in Europe that I mentioned. For sheer imperialist hypocrisy, imagine how the U.S. imperialists would react if Russia and China had a military alliance with large parts of South America and Central America, and if Russia brought Mexico into such a close alliance. The Russians, for their part, have, and especially since 2014, backed sections of Ukraine to break away and ally or merge with Russia. In 2016-17, U.S. NATO, US NATO battle groups were deployed to Poland and other Baltic states like Latvia that border Russia and are really very close to Russia's second largest city, St. Petersburg. Meanwhile, Ukraine has been moving closer to the US and trumpeting its determination to join NATO, the US-led military alliance. This is the immediate backdrop to Russia's invasion in late February. 
The Russian invasion is not about denazifying Ukraine, as Vladimir Putin proclaims. This invasion is designed to bolster Russia's rivalry with the U.S., to command more influence and create a rival pole of power focused in Europe, Central Asia, and the Middle East. For its part, the U.S. is arming Ukraine in order to weaken Russia and prevent Russia from consolidating further imperialist strength and posing greater imperialist challenges to the current world order that the U.S. dominates and of which the U.S., U.S. imperialism, is the main beneficiary. So this is a first cut into why it is the case that Ukraine is a conflict zone between rival imperialist powers and their clashing strategic aims. But we have to pull the lens back further to take in the larger picture. The world imperialist system and the world imperialist economy have undergone big shifts in the last 30 years. And the world imperialist order is undergoing further shifts at major changes today. The US is still the strongest imperialist power economically and militarily. It commands a vast integrated network of global exploitation. The dollar plays a central and privileged role in the world economy. Oil, for instance, is denominated in dollars. And institutions like the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which the US dominates, use loans and finance to twist the economic development of countries of the global south to serve the interests of US imperialist and Western imperialist investment. The US spends astronomically more on weapons than any other country in the world. The US has over 700 overseas military bases in more than 70 countries. But the US's economic strength is declining relative to capitalist imperialist China, which is a rising power. And China is mounting a growing and all-round imperialist challenge to US imperialism, economically, financially, and militarily. Uh, for instance, um, China is investing very heavily in raw materials extraction in Africa. At the same time, the US imperialists are facing Russia as another competitor, which has grown more powerful under Vladimir Putin since the early 2000s. Each of these imperialists has its particular strengths and advantages. Each has a certain freedom to act, but each also faces necessity, the need to act and react to defend and extend empire. Putin cannot allow the US and Western Europe to surround Russia with hostile alliances and advanced weapons. The US is facing the prospect not only of a newly assertive Russian imperialism, but the potential of Russia and China joining together in an alliance against US imperialism. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a move to bring Ukraine back into the, U into the, um, into the Russian imperialist bloc. This is to strengthen Russia's ability to compete with and challenge the US, especially in the area of Europe and Asia. The US, on the other hand, is arming the Ukrainians to weaken Russia and hoping to bog Russia down. The US is using this war to tighten its leadership over West European imperialist countries. The US is imposing sanctions on Russia. You hear that term, sanctions. Sanctions refer to economic measures to deny your adversary access to markets, to finance, 
and to financial holdings that may be held in banks around the world. The U.S. is using sanctions to strangle the Russian ruling class and the Russian economy. This is a dangerous situation. This conflict could rapidly escalate and spiral into an all-out confrontation between the U.S. and Russia. And here is a sobering fact that Andy mentioned that I'm just going to elaborate on. The U.S. and Russia own and command 90% of the world's nuclear warheads. That's some 8,000 nuclear weapons. 2,000 of these weapons are on high operational alert. Both of these powers deploy these weapons in reach of battle zones of this war and its possible spread. This is an existential threat to humanity. Now we can get more into this in the discussion, but there are three things to keep in mind. This conflict in Ukraine is not about Russian autocracy versus American democracy. It is about rivalry between imperial powers. Second, as Bob Avakian has written recently, and as Andy had cited, none of these powers represent the interest of humanity. We must oppose all of them as the monsters in modern day imperialists, um, excuse me, as the, as the monsters in modern day slave masters that they are. But we in the US must give particular emphasis to opposing our own imperialists who have brought incalculable suffering to the people of the world, carried out endless wars of empire, and caused more damage to the environment than any other country on the planet. Third, this war is not happening at any time. As Baba Vikian has analyzed, humanity stands at a crossroads. When the possibilities exist for something terrible or something truly emancipatory. He has shown how this is one of those rare times when revolution in the United States, in the belly of the beast, could actually be possible. And that is what we must be preparing for. In closing, I want to take a few minutes to talk about an important lesson and experience of history that widens our lens of understanding. One of the ways that the US imperialists and their media systematically misinform people is when they talk about an unbroken thread of Russian tyranny. The Russian emperor czars of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, Lenin and Stalin, the rulers of the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s, and Putin. But this idea of an unbroken thread of tyranny erases the reality that there was an era in Russian history and Russian society that was truly liberatory. This was the time of genuine socialist revolution in Russia from 1917 until the early 1950s, but especially the 1920s and early 1930s. The Soviet Revolution inspired the oppressed and exploited throughout the world. The earth-shaking liberatory revolution of October 1917 in Russia, led by the communist leader V.I. Lenin, created the world's first socialist society. It also created the first multinational state based on equality of nations, cultures, and languages. Russia before the revolution was often described as the prison house of nations because of the savage oppression uh, that was meted out by the Russian empire to minority nationalities. I might just say that Russia was called the prison house of nations. The United States is a nation of prison houses. <laughs> The policy adopted and insisted on by Lenin 
was self-determination for the formerly oppressed nations and minorities who joined together in the union of Soviet socialist republics. That was why USSR, meaning that the unity of the new socialist state had to be voluntary. Vladimir Putin, by the way, condemns Lenin for this. The socialist revolution of 1917 involved the people of Ukraine in this spirit of self-determination that was advocated by Lenin, in this revolutionary spirit to create a new world that was what the October Revolution heralded. The people of the Ukraine were involved in this great revolution and so too in the Civil War that followed in the years 1918-21. By 1922, the new Soviet state became a union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The short name for that is the Soviet Union. And Ukraine was one of the 12 founding republics of this union, which also included a great number of self-governing autonomous territories of formerly oppressed nationalities. The Soviet Union under Lenin's leadership and later Joseph Stalin's instituted bold and radical measures to overcome inequality and discrimination. Education was carried out in native languages. Efforts were made to bring forward indigenous local leadership in the formerly oppressed nations. And the Soviet state financed the mass production of books, journals, newspapers, films, operas, folk ensembles, and more in non-Russian languages. At the same time, the Soviet state launched um, education and ideological struggle against what was called Great Russian Chauvinism. That is the belief in the superiority of the Russian people and their right to dominate and oppress other nationalities like white supremacy in the United States. So all of this has been erased and I can get into that and I can also discuss why and how some of these policies got reversed in the 1930s and 1940s, how that fit into the actual weakening of socialism in the Soviet Union and the restoration of capitalism in the mid 1950s. And what Bob Avakian has summed up about that period in the Q&A. And people watching can go to the Set the Record Straight project, thisiscommunism.org, and they can go to revcom.us to do a much deeper dive into this history. So with that, I'll end my talk, and I want to bring Andy Z back to the platform, and I thank you for coming out, and we can get into this more deeply in the discussion that follows. Traffic jam. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, thank you, uh, Raymond. Move this back. So, if you come away from today's program with one point of orientation, a way to approach and think about what is unfolding in the Ukraine. Let it be what's concentrated in this from Basics, a, set, a, a book of quotations from the talks and writings of Baba Vaishnav. This is Basics 3.8. He said that the interests, objectives, and grand designs of the imperialists are not our interests. They are not the interests of the great majority of people in the U.S., nor of the overwhelming majority of people in the world as a whole. And the difficulties the imperialists have gotten the, themselves into in pursuit of these interests must be seen and responded to, not from the point of view of the imperialists and their interests, but from the point of view of the great majority of humanity and the basic and urgent need 
of humanity for a different and far better world for another way, end quote. This Basics 3.8, third chapter, eighth quotation, should guide how you, how we think about and understand what is going down in Ukraine. And more fundamentally, it should guide what we do and yes, what we should not do. We should not be lining up behind, let alone calling for counter moves by the rulers of this country. All who aspire to a world without oppression and exploitation must proceed not from my country, my people, but from the interests of humanity. Our stand is not nationalism or patriotism, it is internationalism, which means the whole world comes first. This is our stand, not thank you for your service of those who enforce US domination around the world. Internationalism is the standpoint of the revolution humanity urgently needs. Internationalism means that the fundamental principle of the new socialist republic of North America that we are trying to bring into being through an actual revolution will be, as it says in the preamble of the Constitution for the new socialist republic, that it will, quote, give fundamental priority to the advance of the revolutionary struggle and the final goal of communism throughout the world, end quote. If we aspire to get to a world, to a society beyond all the divisions among the peoples, a world without exploitation and oppression, we are never going to get there by uniting with or scrambling up under the wing of the ruling class of U.S. imperialism, which is, after all, and as is brought out today, one of the most vengeful and vicious ruling classes in the history of humanity. No, we need to oppose the actions of our own government and ruling class in carrying out their wars, which are wars for empire. More, we welcome any setbacks that they suffer in those wars because that weakens their oppressive hold over the masses of people here and all over the world. This stand is bedrock for revolutionaries in this country. We call it revolutionary defeatism. And it takes on great urgency today when we have entered a rare time when the possibility exists that a revolution could actually be made in this country. What makes this so is how sharp and irreconcilable the divisions are in this country now. We are two countries within one border. And as Raymond said, why this is possible now, why this is such a rare time, and what we have to do about it, and how we can get organized to bring masses of forward, uh, masses of people forward to be part of this revolution is beyond the scope of this forum, although we can entertain questions in the, uh, and, and we can speak to it in the Q&A. Uh, and as uh, Raymond also pointed out, this has gone into in a piece by Bob Avakian for short, um, something terrible or something truly emancipated. It's also in a declaration that's been put out for the last almost year now uh, to get organized now for a real revolution. B.A. has said in these pieces that out of it, an extremely horrific situation that's now made even worse by the extreme war in the Ukraine can give rise to a deep questioning in why the world is the way it is and an openness to and a felt necessity to find out about, to become a part of, and ultimately to join in what humanity needs most of all, which is a revolution for the goal of emancipating all of humanity. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, we might talk just for a couple minutes here, and then we'll uh, open it up to questions and answers from people in the room here, but also online. Um, so if you're online, uh, I think what you do is you put it in the chat, and uh, there, we will be looking at them, not on the stage, but others are looking through it, and then we'll, we'll speak to those questions. All right, so everybody can see, it's all work. It's all good. You got the cameras set up for questions, answers, all that kind of thing. <laughs> all right. Is there and there's a microphone for questions here. Um, you know, I just thought maybe we may be worth uh, just taking a second. We we just you you well described um, 
you know, the, the different power relations in uh, the, the struggle over Ukraine, Europe, all this, the, and the nature of the system that, we, uh, that prevails in the world today. But there's something, a very important framework that I think we should just put out briefly for the audience that uh, is an important contribution of Bob Avakian's uh, or deepening or, and resurrecting of a very important principle that you've written about, which is that imperialism, the dynamic factor in imperialism is competition. It is, it is the, what's been called the uh, organization anarchy contradiction. You've written about this where the fact is, yes, capitalism can be very organized within an enterprise and within a country even to an extent, but that fundamentally the driving factor in capitalism is competition and an expand or die dynamic where, uh, you know, that, you know, because people might have a sense, well, this doesn't make any sense. They, they're going to blow up the world. Why don't they find a, a way to compromise? I've read at least 15 op-eds or articles about people offering their suggestions to the ruling class of both countries of why can't we all just get along, you know, and uh, find a way to work this problem out. Uh, well, there's a reason why they can't work it out. So I just thought it'd be important for you to bring that out because this is very, very important as to why capitalism, imperialism cannot be reformed but must be overthrown. Yeah, as you, um, is my... Uh... You're on. I'm on, okay. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Capitalism, imperialism is a is a global system of exploitation. Uh, it is the drive for profit and more profit, and that drive for profit and more profit is driven by competition. It's not as though Toyota or General Motors can say at the end of the year, "Yeah, we made X amount of money, we're satisfied, and we can go home and vacation." No. Uh, General Motors is an intense competition with Toyota, with Ford, with other corporations, you know, to extend their market share. Why? Because if they don't extend their market share, then another block of capital, you know, conglomerate, bank holding company, in the case of the example of the auto industry, you know, others will then move in to grab that market share that they're relinquishing. So there is this drive this constant drive to expand, to cheapen cost, at the peril of risking, you know, all those investments, you know, that they have that are tied up in factory materials, technology, and um, this very intense market competition. When you see um, the United States imposing tariffs on Chinese goods, that's an expression, you know, of this, you know, competition. And here they're talking about about, you know, about solar panels is the great, you know, is the great boon for saving the planet. Uh, that's another discussion. You know, the planet is, you know, is the, the destruction of the planet and global warming is accelerating, you know, even, you know, as they talk at these global climate conferences about, you know, taking measures. They're not taking measures that in any way contribute to saving the planet. But like you take solar panels, that's a uh, an element of competition. You know, the cheap materials, where do those materials come from? You can't have solar uh, power, you can't have uh, electric vehicles without cobalt, and you can't have cobalt without getting into the mines in the Congo, and you can't do that cheaply and efficiently without child labor. There are 40,000 child laborers in those mines in the Congo. And each of these capitalists and imperialists, they're trying to get their hold on that source of raw materials. That was the example I gave before about China and the US contending in Africa. That's the nature of this system. And it gets you know, expressed at the level of corporations. It gets expressed at the level of banks and bank holding companies. And the most acute expression of this competition is the competition between imperialist nation states for domination of what? Markets, raw materials, regions, and they create um, military alliances. They establish economic treaties. There's people have heard of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Well, that's an agreement in which the US imperialists, you know, are super exploiting Mexico uh, in order to create more profitable conditions for US 
capital, not just in order to function in the U.S. economy, but to contend with other national imperialist capitals, Japan, Western Europe, and now on a global scale, this competition between China and the U.S. is intense. Russia is now increasingly a part of this rivalry and competition for markets, for regions, for military influence. You know, Russia and the U.S. were contending and are contending in Syria. You know, and they're doing so through, you know, weapons, you know, that are being supplied, you know, to the government on the part of Russia and then to different forces out of the government. This is the nature of this system. And this competition and rivalry has led in the 20th century to two world wars. Well, I, you know, I want to, I think it's important for us just to have, you have that as a background. What's the, the, the dri there's driving forces. It's not just uh, capriciousness or some whim. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, I guess it's not really ink if it's on your computer, but there's ink and computers <laughs> being spilled here about, well, actually, Putin's uh, mad. Well, he might be mad, but there's lots of other people who are mad, too. The, the fundamental thing is, is this contention that is, that is built into the system, even as what happens in politics and in, uh, in the contention over ideas and ideology is also has a life of its own. And, and that's where once you get into something like this, people, populations get, get mustered to actually fight for one side or the other. But I, what I'd like to do is actually open this up. The subject matter is the Ukraine. Uh, what's going on? Why is it going on? And what are the interests of humanity? I'm sure a lot of people are, uh, who are watching this are extremely concerned about the situation. If you're not, you're not paying attention. We tried to make that point. Uh, and, and, you know, it is, it is a quite dangerous situation uh, objectively, and it's, uh, it's, it's fraught with uh, that danger, but it also contains within it the possibility for people to understand the world that they live in uh, much more clearly and to see that the real alternative to this has to be a different social system that doesn't give rise to these wars and contentions between rival imperialist powers that then go on to oppress and exploit people within their spheres of interest. So uh, why don't we, are there questions? Just, Andy, on what, just yeah. one thing, yeah. and we, and, and, and in terms of this rivalry in Ukraine, I was giving examples globally. Yeah. In the case of Ukraine, you know, there are two things to keep in mind that in terms of this rivalry. I mean, one is the Ukraine's strategic location, which I addressed in, this, in the talk, and people can look at the map, you know, where it's located, you know, in Europe, but in Europe, straddling Asia, and, and you know, its strategic location is one thing. And the other is the, that, that the Ukraine is what's been called the breadbasket of Europe. It's a very rich agricultural, you know, country, and that, plays an outsized role in, you know, the importance of Ukraine. So I just wanted to sort of bring it back to some of the particulars of this, but I think we should now go to the... Yeah.